clues of heart disease. And let's talk about some oral clues. What should we look for on the tongue? Well, the tongue, and again, this is, as you mentioned, Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine, they have a lot of crossovers as with naturopathic medicine. They actually took the time to listen to people Mm -hmm. and look at them. And the body tells you a lot if you know where to look, and the tongue is the first thing. A white coating on the tongue is classic for digestive dysfunction, can also be a yeast overgrowth. You can see a bright red tip of the tongue, which can be an iron deficiency. Little red spots on the tip of the tongue can also be food sensitivities. Cracks across the tongue can be B12 deficiency. Furrows in the middle of the tongue can be celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. A scalloping of the side of the tongue, like a steak knife, can be thyroid disorders. So again, the tongue tells you a lot right away. Then look at the mouth. Those silver fillings, they're not silver. They're 50% mercury. These I just got mine out last month. I am, for the yeah. first time since a kid, mercury, well, at least in my teeth, mercury-free. And it's for some people, it is a game changer for it, but you've got to do it with the holistic dentist, as you probably yes. did, oh, yeah. that really knows what they're doing. So for anyone considering it, do it right with people. So we also know that the bugs in the teeth and the bugs in the mouth, we find them in the brains of Alzheimer's. We find them in the plaques of people who die of heart attack. So we find the oral bacteria in the plug of the heart in men that die and women that die of heart attack. So we know that this inflammation can start anywhere, and the oral area is one of the big keys. We talk about the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome. Now we're looking at the nasal microbiome, the sinus microbiome. They're all a little bit different, and they all have to be in balance for you to have good health. I had sinus chronus infections for so many years. I had three different surgeries to correct it, none of which we took care of it. In fact, after the last one, I got um, pneumonia. But with changes in diet and lifestyle, imagine that. I never get a sinus infection now. Yeah, we see that the same. When I was at the working at the Mayo Clinic, we did surgery, a study on chronic sinus patients, and we scraped out their sinuses. <sighs> It looked like peanut butter. It was actually fungal infection, not bacterial. So they're get, they were getting antibiotics over and over and over, which were just driving the fungal infection. So again, it's not what you know, it's what you think you know. Yeah. So let's go from there. Let's talk about some external clues and what we should look for. And there are a whole bunch here. Yeah. So uh, talking about the skin, little bumps on the back of the arm, they can sometimes be a food sensitivity mm-hmm. or a lack of essential fatty acids from poor absorption. You can see little skin tags on the eyelids. That can be high triglycerides or high cholesterol. You can see a little blue circle around the iris or the colored part of your eye. That's called arcosinillus, which is related to high cholesterol. You can see a fat pad in the back of the neck, which is not glamorously termed the buffalo hump. That's a sign of insulin resistance. You can have dark areas underneath the arm or on the back of the neck, another sign of insulin resistance. You can see cracked fingernails, brittle fingernails, Brittle hair telling you're not absorbing. Little white spots throughout the fingernails. Zinc deficiency. You can see um, cracked and split nails and and ridges in the nails. Poor absorption. So there's a lot of things that we can see. And it's funny, Michael, because I tell my dermatology friends that, yeah, we can see food sensitivities on the skin. And they look at me funny. And I say, well, there's only one physical sign of celiac disease. This is the disease of wheat. And it's a rash on the shins. It can be anywhere, but it classically seems to go on the shins. It's a dermatitis skin rash. And I say, well, if gluten can cause a rash on the skin, why can't soy or dairy or corn or one of these other food sensitivity allergens? And they just kind of look at me funny and walk away. So we know that what happens in the gut can cause any issues. And the body tells you a lot if you know how to look at it. Our gut, if you, you'll probably agree with me, is really our skin. It's, it's our inside-out body, and it's really our skin. The gut skin and the, the skin on our skin, in many ways, the same thing. You know, someone explained leaky gut, which is this term that's so hard to understand. That's the, the barrier of the gut cells open up a little bit to let things through before they're ready. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like if you turn that inside out and it was your skin, it'd be like your skin had a bunch of scabs in it, and bacteria and bad things could get in. The same thing happens with the inside of the gut. So we see a real relationship to what's going on in the gut to what's happening on the skin. Key and for of- kids that have acne, the first thing you do is go off dairy and sugar, and a lot of them get better. And it's a key point of what we put on our skin that we think, oh, that's just safe. I'll just put some stuff there. 
Two quick, two last things on the external cues. Sure. First off, you said skin tags on the eyelid. What's that mean? What's a skin tag look like? It's like a little tag. It's like a little um, flap of skin. And it's typically dark in color, typically brown. And that's classic with a certain type of cholesterol problem. And can be particularly if you have high triglycerides. Try for three glycerides for fatty acids. So a lot of times that's with the high fatty acid part of the cholesterol. And then the next one was fascinating to me. And I have to go to an, a mirror and check this out afterwards. Earlobes. Yes. So this was actually first mentioned in ancient texts in um, Chinese medicine 3,000 years ago. A 45-degree angle crease in the earlobe in both of them, the same direction, has been correlated to heart health, particularly in men, sudden death particularly. And what we think it is, it's a sign of oxidative stress that for some reason shows up on the earlobe. Your ears have very poor blood supply, very poor perfusion. So maybe they're more sensitive to oxidative stress. And again, think of oxidative stress as inflammation, as heart disease, as everything else. So just because you have those creases don't mean that you're going to have a heart attack. But if you have them, you might want to get checked out. Very cool. And then let's talk about the internal clues. And one of them I'm still working through. It's a lifetime journey from a kid, then having challenges going to Africa, Morocco, and getting parasites as a young adult working on our gut. What can our gut tell us as an internal clue to our heart health? We know so many people come to see me and they say, gosh, I'm just fat. And I look at them and say, no, you're not fat. You're bloated. And so I'll ask them, when you wake up, is your stomach flat? And then after you eat, does it get kind of poofy and, and I call it the Buddha belly? Does yes, it get kind of, get kind of round? And, and my personal experience is um, I test positive to certain foods, particularly dairy and some glutens. And I went to Italy, swam for a month and ate bread three times a day, came back, and my stomach was flat, came and had a, a bagel the first day I was here. And my daughter looked at me at dinner and said, Dad, did you have a bagel? Because you've got a Buddha belly. So it immediately affected it. So it's, it's not just the food, it's where the food is from. But a lot of it tells us, and you can tell by the, now men always look, women never do. But you can tell by the shape, size, consistency of your stool. Is there undigested food? Does it float in the bowl? Is it waxy appearing? Is it particularly foul smelling? All of those things tell you hints about your absorption and about your microbiome. So, and it's saying that Michael still has some work to do. But <laughs> I'm going to go actually after the one that you mentioned, this Elisa thing, which is the name of my sister who actually struggles with an autoimmune challenge herself. What is Elisa? And is there a way to get a test like this at home for food sensitivities? Yes, we're just setting that up ourselves here at the Mental Clinic. And um, there's now finger stick technology, so you don't actually need a blood test. You have to be careful who interprets it, and you have to be careful of the quality because not all tests are the same. But the the um, it's ELISA. It's a technology that looks at um, fluorescence, and it's it's what's used in high quality labs. It's like a CSI crime lab level of detection. Now, sometimes if you eat too much of one food, it can cross the barriers. But what we really want to know is what foods don't get used for nutrition. What foods drive inflammation? And that's what these food sensitivity, they typically measure a protein called IgG. Mm -hmm. And this is not a food allergy test. That's the kid who eats nuts and breaks out in hives and goes to the ER. That's a histamine IgE problem. We're looking at food sensitivities IgG. And there are tests that are available out there, most natural doctors, most functional medicine doctors. But you've got to find someone who really knows what the test means. And what happens to a lot of people is they have this leaky gut or intestinal permeability and the test looks like they're sensitive to everything. And it gets misinterpreted and people get on these really strict nutrition plans. And particularly for young women, you've got to be very careful how you frame bad food and good food. So I focus my practice more on what foods are good for you rather than what foods are bad for you. And let's build that list so you have your good go-to list, not be afraid of your bad list. I'm going to ask just a question more or two. Then we're going to go to this go-to list for the little bit remaining time that we have. How important is our mood in heart health and what can it tell us about heart health? Well, you know, Michael, the number one risk of sudden death after a heart attack is what? It's not cholesterol. It's depression. Ah. And it goes back to the heart rate variability we were talking about. 
the brain has the vagus nerve that touches all of your organs, particularly your heart. And if you are depressed, it changes your heart rhythm. In fact, so that, we affect, also, that affects your, um, well, I'm trying to remember the other heart, uh, uh, Dr. Sinatra we had on who talked about um, if they're depressed before, the mood before yes. heart surgery is going to determine the outcome more than the yes. surgery itself. Well, I, I have a master's degree, in, in, and it was in the pharmacology, immunology of depression. And to me, depression is an inflammatory disorder. We know that all these inflammatory chemicals are high when you're depressed, and they go down when your depression clears. We also, we also feel that serotonin is a key player in depression, but where's all the serotonin in your body? It's not up here. 90% of it's in your gut. So, you know, we call it the gut the second brain. It may actually be the first brain. And we're now finding that the gut and the brain talk to each other with chemicals we're just beginning to understand. There's receptors in the brain for gut chemicals and receptors in the gut for brain chemicals. There's a crosstalk that's become fascinating. So we definitely know that the, the gut brain are linked and then mood and gut health are intimately linked as well. Awesome, awesome. Let's go right from here. Let's jump into foods for a few minutes. I know we've got just a few minutes left. Should we talk about proper foods or should we talk about your Mar Dr. Mark hormone protocol, which includes nutrition? Well, I think they're the same thing. You can't have healthy hormones if you're eating bad food. And there's so many hormone disruptors is the term we use. Mm -hmm. The other term is xenoestrogens. It's just a fancy word for fake estrogen. There's a lot of chemicals in our food supply now the average woman puts on 110 chemicals on her body before she leaves the house for the day. You think of all those brightly colored kid pajamas and kid blankets. Those are all full of chemicals that are hormone disruptors, thyroid disruptors. Look at all the food additives. I encourage everybody listening to go to your food or go to your medicine cabinet and look at all your over-the-counter uh, medications. There's a company, Genexa, that figured this out. They're the only non-GMO, non-additive pharmaceutical company in the world only one drug company figured out you should take the dyes the fillers and the binders out of our kids medicines so really look at the back of your foods and your medicines and look for fillers and binders and additives and food colorings and get those out of there because all of those are hormone disruptors it comes back to clean food clean air clean water it makes such a big difference particularly for our children and really particularly for women you know, I love taking care of women because, you know, Michael, they're just more complicated. They have more hormone systems, but it's thyroid, adrenal, hormone, gut. And if we get all of those lined up, women do really, really well. They reduce the risk of heart disease, the risk of dementia, and they feel good. And we need women in our world to feel good because they're the ones that are driving our health care. Woohoo! So a last note on hormone disruptors. Tell us about how much of a plastic fan you are. <laughs> well, I line everything I eat with plastic and I microwave every single thing that I do. No, I'm joking. Um, I, I use a, a stainless steel cup is on my desk. I believe in glass instead of plastic. Um, I think even BPA free plastic is not good. There's just too much plastic in the world. This beautiful community of Jackson Hole just recently went to plastic bag free community. How did it take us this long to figure it out? So I encourage everybody to avoid all plastics, for sure recycle everything that you can. But you know the biggest source of bisphenol A, which is the BPA in plastics, do you know where it is? It's yeah. in the receipts you get at oh, stores. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Does Whole so Foods, just, I've been wondering, does Whole Foods, do you know, do they have, have they done away with it? Most of them have, they, they have the idea of, would you like a printed receipt, no receipt, or an email receipt? And so, again, for all the moms out there, particularly the pregnant moms, the breastfeeding moms, never handle a receipt because you're getting a huge dose of BPA as soon as you touch that thermal generated receipt. Avoid them like the plague. We've had an expert on on this talking about how the idea of in moderation also doesn't work with a lot of these chemicals, like with BPA, that actually a fractional amount can be as harmful as a large amount. Plus, it sticks around in the body for 20 years. So, yeah, this is one of those cases where, you know, I love the idea of being a doctor moderation unless it's things like these toxins or things like gluten. If you have a high sensitivity to it, then you just need to do your best to be at zero. It's hard in our world, but you can make these choices. Awesome. We've got to let you go. Do you have time to talk supplements for just a quick sec? And then I want to steer people to your website. 
I, I'd love to. You know, I, I never thought that I would use supplements in my practice. So my first day in the intensive care unit, the nurses walked over and they, had, they held out a bedpan that rattled. And I asked them what that was. And they said, well, you're the new nutrition doctor. You should know. These are the vitamins that doctors prescribe to their patients. It's the number one selling vitamin in the country. There's 46 additives holding that vitamin together. The nurses call them bedpan bullets because they go right through the body. And I have a picture when I lecture to doctors showing a small intestine with five of these tablets in it. So supplements are supplemental. They should supplement your nutrition and let food be medicine, kitchen your pharmacy, lifestyle your doctor. But when you're ill and to protect you against certain things, there's times you need to supplement. But you really need to choose high quality supplements. And in general, I think people take too many. So I think being really smart and have an expert guide you on the quality and quantity of what you should do. And most of what the bottle says, divide it in half. Usually don't need, except a prenatal, mm -hmm. usually don't need most of what they say because they're trying to sell you more of it. But I'm a big fan of targeted high quality supplementation. It's been the needle mover for my sick patients. Are there a few key ones that you recommend for people? You know, most people benefit from a good, healthy multivitamin, mm -hmm. perhaps every other day, just because our soils are so depleted. Make sure it has a good mineral base. It's methylfolate, methyl B12 in it. That's your first line of idea. It's a high quality. But look at the other ingredients. There should not be more than three things and things you can't pronounce you shouldn't eat. Um, some people benefit from a probiotic. One key with probiotics is never take it at the same time as an antibiotic. Spread it out <laughs> during the day because if you take it at the same moment, you cancel each other out. A lot of people don't know that. There seems to be an epidemic of vitamin D. Most doctors ignore it. I think vitamin D is crucial. It's a steroid hormone, not a vitamin. I think it's one of the things that we miss the most. I do think a lot of people also benefit from omega-3s because we're just not getting good quality, but get quality omega-3s. Most patients come in with rancid vitamin, I'm sorry, rancid omega-3s. They bought it at a big box store. But really, again, I think supplements are supplemental to a good nutrition plan. And I do think if you use targeted supplementals for good conditions, then every medication depletes certain nutrients. And so you want to look, there's several companies that have lists of what medicines deplete what. Like the number one diabetes medicine, glucophage, depletes B12 in 60% of people who take it, which contributes to your risk of neuropathy, which is one of the causes of diabetes. So it's it's just interesting how we're coming full circle with our knowledge of supplements. And, and you're, if you're a vegan or even vegetarian, then you need a B12 supplement, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Two, two last supplements. We'll begin to really wrap this up quickly. First off, glutathione. Well, glutathione um, is interesting. It's what your liver makes to help you to get this phase one, phase two detoxification. Basically, your liver gets rid of bad things. And most of us with the stress of our world are depleted. And some people genetically, we know this on our new genetic tests, they just don't recycle this chemical called glutathione. So it's like a super antioxidant. And people with specific conditions, particularly um, neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, David Perlmutter showed men with Parkinson's that could barely walk, they'd get IV glutathione and they could walk down the hall 20 minutes later. So there are some magic things that we see with this. But like anything, too much of something can be a bad thing. So for the right person and the right amount, it can be a game changer. I have a craving whenever I go for Japanese food for natto. What can you tell me about vitamin K? Well, you know, vitamin K and natto, natto kinase is very interesting. And there's a new one. Um, out called lumbrokinase, which is actually made from the earthworm. And it's a natural blood clot preventer. And it doesn't do the problems that blood thinners do. It's kind of like Ms. Pac-Man. It goes and looks for things building up and chews up the clot before it even forms, but doesn't have all the side effects of blood thinners. And I think, you know, the K is very interesting. K is a family of vitamins. And doing the vitamin D with the K2 seems to be yes. good for bone health for women, but also seems to be good for the lining of the heart. And so really looking at the foods, you can get it, but it, it may be something we start implementing. So I'm a big fan of both vitamin D and K2 for multiple reasons. I, I like balancing the two of them. Do you, are the vitamin D recommendations, you said take most recommendations, cut them in half. Does the same hold for vitamin D? You know, it's interesting because there's four vitamins that you can get toxic in. And what are they? A, D, E, and K. And it's really the vitamin A. I've seen someone in liver failure from taking too much vitamin A in my residency. And vitamin D, I do see people taking 10 and 20,000 units a day that get high levels. I've never seen a, a clinical disease from it. But typically, if you're taking high levels, 5,000 to 10,000, 
you should check your levels just to be sure you're not getting super, super therapeutic, we call it, or getting too much. Excellent. So, cool. and, and more in the winter, less in the summer. That makes sense. CoQ10. My favorite nutrient is CoQ10. Uh, you mentioned Stephen Sinatra. He's one yes. of my favorite doctors. There's a new CoQ10 called MitoQ, which um, goes into the mitochondria better. That's going to be the future of CoQ10 therapy. So we're getting smarter and smarter at our supplements, and we're finding things like this MitoQ and, and natokinase and lemurokinase. We're just getting better at finding these new um, targeted ways to get better results and be more efficient. So it's a, it's a fun time to be in functional integrated medicine because it's exploding with knowledge and we're actually helping people that medicine isn't able to help or they're helping them using medications that have all of these downside effects. Since you mentioned medications, what can you tell us about getting off of pharmaceuticals or seeing our doc to get off of them? Well, I was taught that every medication is a poison with one good side effect, and that side effect is its pharmaceutical use. Now, that's a little cheeky to say, but it's actually true. So um, we do need medicines. There's time, like I said, in acute care medicine, you need medicines, and there's some benefit for some people for medications. I can't tell you how many 70-year-old patients I have that take no medications. They came in with 12 or 14 medications. Now they're not on any, and they're healthier. One of my patients went back to her Mayo Clinic physical for her executive physical, mm -hmm. and her doctor said, you're off your cholesterol drugs, you're off your diabetes drugs, your cholesterol is better, and your blood sugars are better. What did you do? So he called me and asked what I did. I told him, he said, that'll never work for everybody. Well, if it works for one, it'll work for 100, it'll work for 1,000. The model works. It's just that you have to have a partnership, a relationship. And you know, as doctors, challenge your doctor to walk the walk and talk the talk. Have them be the model of health, like yourself as a vegan, you're into food, you're into exercise, you meditate, you've got your HRV watch. You know, find doctors that, that are passionate about their own health and are willing to share it with you. On that note, where can people go to find out more, to find your beautiful book, to find out about Destination Wellness, and, and I want to see about sending you a pinprick of blood here, which is really, really cool. <laughs> where do we go? Well, go to Amazon to find the Heart Solution for Women. It's the easiest way to order it. You can come to our website. You'll get a bunch of free bonuses that give you information like all the physical signs that we talked about. There's a PDF that you can download for free from our website on that. It's menoclinic.com, M-E-N-O-C-L-I-N-I-C.com, menoclinic.com. We'd love to see you there. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch menoclinic.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll send you over to menoclinic.com. This has been fantastic, Mark. I could keep going. I'm sure you could keep going. You've got patience to see. On that note, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? Well, I want to thank you, Michael. It's because of people like you sharing this information that we're empowering our clients with knowledge and information to change their behaviors and get healthier. So, so kudos to you. And, and thank you as well. Woo <laughs> so for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get heart solution for women, and begin healing your heart today and shine bright. Woohoo! Woohoo! Awesome, 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 Mark. Thank you, Michael. You're a great interviewer. I appreciate the time. I had a phenomenal heart healing time talking with Dr. Mark. I hope you did too. To hear more heart healing interviews, click here. Subscribe below.